Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard Hawley from Stonehenge Aotearoa and uh, this is the night sky. Now, I'm just going to get the laptop on for this. God, gotcha, gotcha. Now we, now we can see some stars. Anyway, so this is Richard. We also brought Kay along with me as usual. Hello, Kay. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and that other bloke over there. Hello there. Keith Austin, okay. Yeah. Don't call him that other bloke. <laughs> well, he is another bloke. <laughs> he is, but he's an important part of the team. He is an important part of the team. He's, he's, he's a little bit of an astronomer, but he's also a wonderful musician. Anyway, anyway, what we're going to be talking about, first of all, is the Star of Bethlehem. Very briefly, but we're at Stonehenge, we're doing a very special presentation. So what was the Star of Bethlehem? Was it, um, is it myth? Is it fact? What is it? And in fact, actually, once you delve into it, it's actually a very fascinating story. So we're doing a special presentation on all the mysteries and legends surrounding the Star of Bethlehem. And that's on Friday, December the 22nd, starting at 7.30pm. So Friday, 20, December 22nd. Now, you look at some of the other stories as well though as well as the star of Bethlehem oh don't yes you? yes yeah mm. no we'll be look, we're going to be looking at things like other. the great flood and other great stories from the bible as well all right and look at how they stack up against uh, historical records that we've got and so on and it's actually quite fascinating once you begin to work through it yeah anyway you do need to book in so if you um you would like to come along to that special presentation you know, give us a call at stonehenge and have a word with Kay. All right, so that's the star of Bethlehem coming up soon. Okay, and all, incidentally, also the star of Bethlehem occurs on the on the date of the solstice, which is also significant, as we will be showing you later. Anyway, what I thought we'd talk about tonight, we've been looking around the summer stars, but by midnight, the summer stars come into full view, and of course, the number one object in the sky is Orion. And so, what I thought tonight is so many things in the constellation of Orion, which just about anyone can recognize in our sky. I thought I'd take you through a journey on these things. And what we're going to do is a journey through space. Actually, we're going to look at the closest objects first and then gradually move further and further away around there. But before we get on, just to mention a couple of the other bright objects in the sky, of course, there's Orion there. Of course, of course, in the southern hemisphere, appears upside down. Upside down, yes. <laughs> okay. So let's bring him up. There he is there, Orion. There's some great stories around Orion, but uh, you know, we can talk about those at a later date. Okay, so there's Orion there. And, of course, the big bright star-like object in the sky is the planet Jupiter. Okay? And that's a, a magnificent object even seen in a small telescope. So that's the planet Jupiter there. And following behind that, we've got Matariki the famous star cluster. So Orion, and then just forward of that, coming down in Langle, Matariki and Jupiter. The interesting thing is, uh, is people don't realise that the stars you see in the early morning in June, you see in the evening in November. That's right. The difference being there that the June time is the sacred time, usually the rising of the sun is sacred in most groups, and in the evening it's a really good time for teaching because the sky is getting darker and darker instead of lighter and lighter that's right yeah and we always we always that's why we always like to do something on matariki um in in the autumn because what, what in summer yes yeah, because it means that people can actually come out and see it while they're getting up at dawn in the middle of winter and the sky is getting brighter as case and it becomes more and more difficult. All it does is lift in the sky a bit more, yeah. but the sky is just getting darker and easier to yeah. see things. Yeah, and it's not and just it's Matariki, it's all the other important stars to Maori cosmology mm. and so on it spread right the way around the heavens. Yes, the whole walker is in <clears> the sky. <throat> anyway, we'll have a look at this uh, thing called Orion, okay? So we'll bring it up a little bit closer, all right? just to identify some of the bright objects. And I said, what we're going to do is we're going to go through space and time. You see, there's the pot, right? Which only in, <laughs> those in New Zealand would call that the pot because anywhere else it's actually the belt and the sword below it, okay? That's the pot of stars there. And 
Orion is special also because it is dominated by bright stars, not just bright because they're close to us at all, but intrinsically very, very luminous stars. So they're the stars, giant stars. The stars themselves are incredibly bright. Yeah, yes. they're all yeah. giants and so on. But there's one there that looks like a star that isn't. <laughs> It's in the handle of the pot. Yes. Now we'll be having a look at that. So this is the realm of the giants that we're going to be having a look. So let's start off with the closest of all is Bellatrix, right? That's a lower left-hand star. Uh, that's called the Amazon star. And I said it's the closest. Even then, it's 240 light years away. Right? Oh, yes, yes. So we're seeing it as it was 240 years ago, right? And uh, Bellatrix, if you could go out there... Um, is a bluish white star. It's so hot that a lot of its light is actually going off in ultraviolet radiation, all right? But in total luminosity, it's 21,500 times brighter than the sun. So. <laughs> yes, that <laughs> planet that you have there, uh, the hypothetical planet, doesn't look like a good place to go for my holidays. No, no, it wouldn't. No. It'd be quite rather warm. Okay. It'd be incredibly hot and absolutely blasted with yeah. ultraviolet radiation. Yeah. Oh yeah, well this is it because yes. because it's tilted. The, there's so much UV. Most of its energy is coming out in the ultraviolet radiation. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, which would cook you very quickly. Okay. So that's Bellatrix. Okay. Then after what that, the second nearest star is Betelgeuse. There is that, okay? Now, if you look at all those stars up there in the Orion, you'll see that most of them appear bluish white, and that's because they're very, very hot. But what's obvious when you look at Betelgeuse, it's not. It's oh. a reddish colour, all right? Mm. And indeed it isn't. It, it's Betelgeuse means shoulder of the giant, and it is 640 light years away, okay? Almost three times further away than Bellatrix. And Betelgeuse is what we call a red supergiant. Okay, now I've got an image up here, probably looking at it. Imagine looking at Betelgeuse from beyond the orbit of Pluto. This is what it would look like. Okay, <laughs> and it's it's got a, a diameter of between 764 and 1,000 times that of the Sun. And the reason why I say that is it pulsating. It's it varies. It varies. Exactly. It pulsates yes. in, in brightness yes. and its diameter. Its average luminosity is equal to 87,100 suns. Okay? It would have been brighter than those blue ones, wouldn't it? And it because it was bigger and brighter, its lifespan was shorter. And that's right. And because it's it originally it was a big, nice, big, hot blue star, then over time it's evolved, as Kay says, and it's expanded into this red supergiant star of colossal size. Yes. And um, I just for those of you watching this on uh, TV, I've just brought up a uh, um, a model showing you Betelgeuse and the Sun two scale. As you can see, uh, the Sun looks like a tiny planet compared to. Betel Jews, all right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But it's also uh, what we call a supernova countdown because these giant stars do not end their lives like a, a, the average star quietly dimming away and that sort of thing. They end their lives in violent explosions on a, when I say violent, on a cosmic scale when oh. a star blows up. And we know that Betel Jews is going to end its life. And of recent times, people have been very interested in keeping an eye on it because it is showing some peculiar behaviour at the moment. Yes, it, uh, for a while it was um, unusually dim and then it started to brighten again. And um, you could actually see it uh, through a telescope. You could see that it wasn't producing the light it usually does. Mm. And then it started to come back up again. It's just some very strange behaviour. Yeah. Yeah, yes. and fortunately it is over 600 light years away. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be within 100 light years of this thing when it explodes. If Betelgeuse does um, say tomorrow it uh, went supernova, <sighs> how would that affect us on Earth? Difficult to say. We never have anything that close before, but what I can tell you, it'd be so bright you'd be able to see it in broad daylight. Yes. Okay? Yeah. And arriving from that before, before the brightness will be a mass of atomic particles. So you, what you wouldn't want to be is anything in space or anything like that. It could well uh, disrupt space stations and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So an astronaut floating in space... Was not a good idea. No. No, not with that. might be in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> 
okay so that that's betelgeuse and as i say you go out at night folks and have a look uh, look at the constellation of orion and you can see that the betelgeuse have got that definite color which is different from the others all mm -hmm. right yeah. So that's special juice. Then, then we move, then move out to Saf, the upper right-hand star. This is the fainter of the brighter stars. Saf means the eye of the tiger, and it is 722 light years away. And is, we know it's a rapidly rotating star. It's 57,000 times brighter than the sun. And when I keep saying this, folks, for don't for a moment think that there's something puny about our sun it, actually our sun is brighter than the average star yes. the vast majority of stars in the, uh, are, are what they call dwarf stars the giants are very few and we but they stand out over vast distances and they dominate our sky yes. simply because they are so bright okay so our star it, i like to think of our sun as being fair to middling it's right in the middle between the tiny little stars and the um, massive big blue white and red giants that we see would that be right? That's right, go. yeah. And because yeah. it's spinning so rapidly, it has a slight football shape to it. Yeah. Because the centrifugal force is forcing the um, the material out along the equator. Yep, and it's also yes. they've got dis disks of matter. And in fact, actually looking at that, all stars tend to start off like that as ro rapidly rotating with disks of matter. And then the magnetic mm. field interacts with the disc and the disc uh, sort of speeds up and the star slows down and that disc is the yes. material from which the planets are formed yeah that is amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so next we come to uh, <clears throat> big bright rigel the left top left it means the giant's leg rigel it is 773 light years away and it is also another super giant but it's it's all really evolved away from what Bellatrix is like. It's already getting brighter and brighter and it's eventually going to be turning into a red supergiant star. And it is a colossal star, okay? It's 120,000 times brighter than the sun, right? Uh, but it's not just one sun, it's actually a system of five stars. And for those of you looking this at uh, this on a TV, in this uh, painting I've made, at the upper right corner, you see two other bright stars. Well, they are actually part of the Rigel system, and each of those is a double star, right? Mm. But of course, normally, you're, without telescopes and that sort of thing, you only see Rigel itself. So this is another star, which is eventually going to be turning into one of those big supernovas. But it will, with the passage of time, turn into a red supergiant, just like Betelgeuse, right? That's what the process is at the moment. And it's so hot at the moment, it's ejecting matter from its surface. Yes, so in the painting there, we can see the halo of yeah. material being ejected from Absolutely. the Absolutely, yes. yeah. yeah. Well, having, having got to that point, do you think we should get uh, Keith to sing a song or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's getting towards Christmas, and we're talking about the Star of Bethlehem. Yeah. Whatever it was, it might might have been a star, or it might have been something supernatural, or or whatever. But um, I've got my flute here. I'm still learning to play my flute. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. Good. Right, you can play a tune to Rigel then. Uh, I'm trying to remember my fingering. Come on. Thank you, Keith. Well done. And in the next break, Kay's going to sing us a song. So how about that? <laughs> <laughs> She's giving me a big smile at the moment. Right.
Oh, I know you'll talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> right, now we're going to have a look at the belt stars, right? And I've got a lovely photograph of the belt stars themselves, but we're bringing that up now. There they are. And you can immediately see their blue giant stars, uh, bluish in colour, all right? And, but you're also in this photograph, you're beginning to see the background nebulosity around there, the mm. dust and gas and so on, okay? So the closest them uh, is al Tak, which means the girdle is 820 light years away and 90,000 times brighter than the sun, okay? And then... After that, we have Mintaka, which means the belt, that word. And it's actually a, a triple star system there, as you can see. Um, and the, the brighter is actually what we call an O-type star. It's, the vast majority of its energy is in UV, all right? Um, O-class stars are the biggest and brightest yes, stars, yeah. aren't they? Yes. Now, that is 1,200 light years away, and its star is 100,000 times brighter than the sun. And then at the centre there we have Al Nilam, which means the string of pearls, and it's 1300 light years away and 375,000 times brighter than the sun. So you can see these are all <laughs> big giant stars there. Yes. But I want you to take a close look. You see, these stars, giant stars don't live long. This is the thing. Our sun lives for billions of years. These giant stars are only going to be living for tens of millions of years. That's all, because they burn their energy up so rapidly. Yeah. And behind, you, around or surrounding them, you can see the nebulosity from, what, from which these stars were actually formed. Okay? The other thing I'd like to point out is I've just pulled up a photograph of the Pyramids of Geyser. Uh, Giza. Uh, Giza. Yes. Giza. That Giza, yeah. Uh, and what people have noted is the orientation and the size of the pyramids appears to be direct copy of the belt of Orion. Is that a yes. coincidence or not? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> the, um, uh, I have seen um, photographs uh, taken vertically down on the, on the three main pyramids of uh, Giza and some people say that the Nile River represents the Milky Way near the uh, three belt stars mm. of, of Orion. And I don't think that is a coincidence. The, the alignments are very, very close. Yeah. And, the, you know, the sizes and the alignments are very close. There's obviously some form of Orion worship going on there. Well, I think is, uh, for those of you who come along to our star of Bethlehem, that's one of the things you'll learn how important the stars were and how much yes. it was based upon that. It's not just the star of Bethlehem. All of those stars up there had special meanings and so on and so forth. And, uh, yeah. But even if you just look at navigation, the um, middle star rises absolutely due east and sets absolutely due, due west, west. Yeah, that's right. And that's a pretty important navigational star. Absolutely. And yeah. if you live, I mean, we see a desert area now right close to the Nile and only a tiny strip, but it was more verdant in the past, but mm -hmm. it still was backed up by a big desert. Yeah. And if you're going to pass that desert, you need your navigation. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> As Kay just mentioned, we've all often got to remember when we look back into the past that, that our planet and the environment, everything is evolving all the time. And again, when you see a, a, a picture that she says is the, the pyramids and that in the past, we, we tend to look at Egypt as it was, is today. But we know now that yeah. it, actually it was they green. Actually had, they had a man-built harbour right next to the pyramids and they yeah. were shipping stuff up by ship yeah. right yeah. to the pyramids yeah yeah pretty it, amazing stuff is, yeah. i it, mean we talk about those sorts of things as pretty marvelous when we do them now but you know yes. that's a long time ago not only did they build the yeah. pyramids they built a tremendous infrastructure well, these, are, these are some of the things that are going to be going into the star of fm you you cannot okay. assume that things today are I'll the say, same as they were oh, a thousand no. or two thousand years ago all right um, yeah. And the Great Sphinx, the body of the Great Sphinx, um, some geologists have um, argued that it has rain erosion, not sand erosion. Well, and yeah. when did it last rain in Egypt? And they mm. saying, no, it can't possibly be that because it was made 4,000 mm. years ago. Obviously, not the bottom say, part. It's yeah, carved they, out of something exactly, that was older. Exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah much but older. There's, there's <laughs> no doubt that, as Richard said, the 
the, uh, so many of these people all around the world, they attach tremendous importance to the stars, <coughs> to, to, the, to the stars and what they believe the stars <coughs> were telling them. And this comes right back to our original discussion of the Star of Bethlehem. Yeah. yeah. But also, you see, what they've begun to realise, because we're talking about climate change and things like that now, and what people are be stories are beginning to realise is that the collapse of many great civilizations is actually being due to changing climate. Suddenly the rains stop coming. Mm -hmm. Without the rains... You didn't produce the food for the people, and the whole thing collapses in. Just look at our own climate. Yeah, well, that's yeah. right, and this is the danger. What here? I mean, uh, if you ask the people in Hawkes Bay, I mean, they'd have a quite a different view from standard people on climate change. I think, yeah. having experienced it, yeah, right, yeah. you know, through their houses, yeah. literally. Yeah, your way of life yes. completely changes. Well, look at the um, the Anasazi. Um, the ancient ones in, uh, the, in what is now the Arizona desert and they had a massive big civilization there and all of a sudden it just vanished and the only thing they could do that apart from a massive warfare which there seems to be no sign of is a sudden sudden climate change yeah. which some put down to a mm. change in the sun's output yeah but I see the thing is that for a long while, it, there would be always saw civilization as collapses due to warfare or something, but now we're realizing it's not. We're living in this world where there is changes in climate and that, mm. and we have to adapt. And if you can't adapt, yes, you go under, you really do, yeah, right. So, there you are now. Now, in the um, looking at the nebulosity, there. Uh, for those who can see the on TV closer, the, the bright star is the Horsehead Nebula. We'll have a look at that in closer detail. There it is. There, okay. And you can see the Horsehead, and the Horsehead is simply a, a, a dark column of dust and gas from which stars are formed. But its density is such that it's it's erosion because they said all of the cloud around these big bright stars is eroding away, being blasted away. But the denser regions stay behind, and so we get this. Uh, picture of this horse but i actually think uh, it, not as a horse i always see it as the hippo nebula because if you look at it you look like you're looking at the bum of a hippo and his head is looking <laughs> around at you from behind okay i was just thinking that frank andrews <laughs> always used to say that <laughs> Did he? yeah he always said that yeah yeah, yeah. if you watch those things that's the horse head nebula yeah and there's another wonderful photograph that here taken, taken with the web telescope capturing all the nebulosity and that around that bright yellow bit is where it's really hitting it the yeah. uh, the influence of those very bright stars is really hitting down on there the solar winds from them that's a, yeah. well, it's, it's, well, still a word it, it, yes. keith was saying earlier if you yeah. if you're on a planet around a smaller star near these big ones that, that any atmosphere on the planet will simply get be swept away yeah yeah, yes. yeah i guess this whole forming solar yeah. system swept away really <laughs> Okay, so we're back down, back, uh, drawn back out to have a look at the vine. Now we're going to have a look at the nebulosity. Now this is a, a long exposure photograph revealing all the nebulae that are around there. Okay, and essentially when you look, we look at the red nebulous uh, nebulae, we're mostly looking at um, emission. In other words, what's happening is that the gas and that dust absorbs the radiation, the UV, and then re-emits it. Okay. Yes. Uh, the other colours are simply reflecting the colours of nearby stars. And at the top there we've got Rigel, all right, top left hand corner. There, and next to Rigel is the Witch Head. So there it is there. Hmm. You see the Witch's Head? <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, the Witches are always European, aren't they, with pointy noses? Of course they've got pointy noses. But I mean the European, <laughs> that's characteristically a oh, European oh, thing. Probably is, yeah. yeah. And chin, yeah, that's right. So there's the wind hit, which head nebula, which, as I said, is actually just a reflection. It's just reflecting some of the light from Rigel, which is to the right, the big bright star to the right. Okay. And then, but the most fabulous thing, of course, in the Orion's nebula is along the sword, right? And this is the Orion nebula. Yes. So we'll, we'll bring that up. And look, folks, you can see this quite easily with a pair of binoculars. And the bigger and bigger telescope you've got, the more detail you see. So we'll go and have a closer look at that. So we'll bring it up now. So there it is there. So 
So there's the belt. You can see the three stars, the horse head nebula. And then we go up the sword to the Orion Nebula there. And it is a region, it's the nearest region, where st massive numbers of stars are being born right now. Okay, so there it is there. That's the Orion Nebula. That's part of the sword. And um, we'll go and have a closer look at it. Right? New Zealanders call it the handle of the pot, don't they? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Mm. We'll bring it up there. And there we are. Okay. And what you can see there is that it's surrounded by blue stars and so on. But at the centre there, what you've actually got is a crater uh, with stars that have been formed inside, blasting outwards. So we'll have a look at this in more detail. Um, mm. And down yes. at the bottom, and you, you can see this in actually in a relatively small size, is what we call the trapezium, which is the thing that's created that. Uh, there's actually hundreds and hundreds of stars, but the ones at the bottom of the trapezium, there's a, there we are just down here. So there's hundreds of stars in the nebula creating. In, the, in that, that region, that illuminating all. Yes. But these four big, bright, super hot stars, which form the tra trapezium, I've just put up there, the distance is 1,344 light years. Mm. These are numbers I find interesting because once upon a time it would be 1,300 light years away now with the modern telescopes, <laughs> they go right down to small digits and so on. And the trapezium, as I say, you can see that in a relatively small telescope. But if you look around that picture, you can see other stars and they've got like comet-like tails and that's because the intense radiation is pouring out from these stars. The smaller stars are getting evaporated away by these yes, giants. It's, it's blasting away the yeah, stuff from the yeah. stars here. And again, we're looking at um, emission, um, an, an emission nebula. Uh, um, emission nebulae are basically they're lit up the same way that a, uh, a neon tube or a neon sign is lit up with high energy being put into it that jostles the atoms and the atoms emit uh, invisible emit, emit light, light yeah. um, um, often often visible light it's uh, it's a spectacular and often very beautiful uh, light show but you need mm. a good telescope to see it like that oh yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, let's take them now, but I think that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, the distance between stars, right, is only one and a half light years, and the age is being determined as being just 300,000 years. Now, I know 300,000 years might sound a lot to you, but it's the age of a star, it's nothing. Remember, our sun's four and a half billion years old, yes. okay? Yeah. So these are, ba these are truly our baby stars baby okay. stars just being born now i've just brought one of them up there theta right it's actually equal to 250,000 suns mm. right? but you don't it doesn't appear that bright because virtually most of its energy is uv it's in short wavelengths that we yes. can't see yeah but that in turn that that uv is then being absorbed by the cloud and re-emitting that light when you look at some of these pictures, you notice that the colours change between different versions. And some of them are because the Hubble actually looked in black and white and they assigned yeah. different colours to yeah. the, the different frequencies. And some of them are because you're looking at different frequencies of light, like mm. UV yeah. or ultraviolet. Well, what happens with cameras yeah. and telescopes. So sometimes when Richard changes a picture, you notice the colours change. Yeah. I can always pick the Hubble ones because they look a little bit artificial real turquoisey and purple and a <laughs> little bit you know a little bit right. yeah quite right yeah. yes yeah okay so and this is what this is look, look at this photograph here <laughs> this is what's happening in in that vicinity we've got stars uh of 100 plus mass rotating really rapidly okay Okay, so that, that's the uh, Great Orion Nebula. And as I said to you, it's a great crater in the sky. So if we can bring the crater up there, there's the crater rim. So we'll look at an angle, so you can imagine, once upon a time, this was a bubble when these new stars are forming, and this bubble has expanded outwards and then has collapsed and it sends out debris. And you can see the stuff around the top rim there, that's the material that's blown out from there, okay? So it's a pretty action-packed place the orion nebula yes, there's a lot going on in there. <laughs> there certainly is yeah so that, that that's orion our summer sign of summer and while orion is in our sky we're going to have the 
warm long days all right so yeah. it's our summer sun but of course in winter it's um so in in uh, in the northern hemisphere it's the sign of winter but what we're what we're looking at right now and i just pulled out a picture of what it's going to look like in the future because as those giant stars are all born, they're going to expand outwards and there's going to be a massive cluster of stars. Right? But that's just something I put together, folks, because it's still going to be a long time. So how far away in the future is that, Richard? A few millions of years. It's such yeah. a rapidly changing place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so as I said, <laughs> watch it. just to remind you, uh, if you want to learn about the stars and trek around you can do a star trek at stonehenge but they do need to be booked all right well in advance and we take you around the heavens and pick out all the bright stars and constellations plants this is a real photo isn't it this yes is. this is yeah <laughs> so i it mean is. it's not you putting a star field no with the no, thing on the front no, it's actual photograph no, of stonehenge right, yeah. and yeah. the stars it's that's a long right. exposure yeah mm long space actually done by one of our visitors that came out to Stonehenge yes yeah. see the Milky okay. Way and one of the yeah. Magellanic clouds now we're open from Wednesday to Saturday at the moment from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. we're closed December 24th 25th and 26th and after that we're going to be open every day from 10 to 4 all right over the Christmas bed and just to remind you coming up we've got the Star of Bethlehem 7 30 p.m. On December 22nd but you do need to book okay, you can book in through event finder if you yeah. want to mm. there's two ways there's our uh, Zola booking system which is attached to the web page and there's the um, event finder booking system yeah. okay folks having said that we're going to shut up now and we're, we'll get together again yes. in the new year <laughs> and season's greetings to everyone out there or all our viewers and listeners and we look forward to seeing you on the 22nd. Absolutely. Stay safe.